So our next lightning speaker, will take less time than we just took setting this up, uh, is Maggie McElpine. Uh, she specializes in a whole lot of things relating to uh, voting. Uh, she worked on the Estonian case. Uh, she has worked on risk auditing uh, uh, metrics. Uh, but really, please. All right, thanks very much, guys. So uh, I don't seem to be projecting, guys. Oh. What? Oh, just drag it? Or? Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll get there eventually. Well, basically, um, yes, I've, I've worked on the Estonia e-voting paper with uh, the University of Michigan, and I've also um, uh, advised the California Secretary of State's office on their post-election audit pilot program of 2013, and I also work in election security, and I've run transitive audits specifically in multiple states, but I've also done a risk-limiting audit in Colorado. So I sort of accidentally became perhaps the person who scanned the most ballots anywhere for uh, transitive audits. At maximum was 160,000 one time. And uh, we learned a lot of interesting lessons from that. So I think uh, my previous speakers were really great in kind of covering some of the basics of how risk-limiting audits work. Um, with the statistical analysis. And uh, the transitive audits, though, are kind of interesting. Maybe people aren't familiar with those. It's basically running a black box uh, against a clear box, which is commercial off-the-shelf off the shelf scanners. And then we run it through a program called Open Count, which kind of is a little bit like uh, running it against a second voting machine. Not literally, but because we can't go into the voting machines, by comparing the two, we can um, basically determine the accuracy of the results. And, uh, but there are some pitfalls to that, which is not to say we shouldn't do them. There's also a lot of really interesting benefits. It'd be really useful if you could see my slides right now, though. That would help a lot. Amazing. Yeah. 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 So, um, hooray. Unfortunately, that means I can't see my notes that were on the slides, but I'll just have to wing it. Well, now you've had a preview. So like I was saying, uh, you know, there's the transitive audits, which are a little bit lesser known, but they're also very exciting. So let's go into very quickly why we need to do audits. Um, they basically, they, as other presenters have said very nicely, they help uh, ensure the public trust. Uh, it's, you know, uh, paper ballots provide a uh, publicly acceptable forensic artifact of the voter's intent, which is also anonymous. Um, and there should, uh, and uh, basically what we're advocating is that there should always be an audit done at the end of an election, regardless of the difference in results. And this is uh, regardless if it's a landslide, because if it's a landslide, it's very easy and low cost. To, you only have to pull a few ballots, relatively speaking. Um, and if it is close, then it should be audited to keep people from being annoyed. So uh, it also kind of, if you don't have it every time, and for example, one problem you see a lot with recounts is that the loser can get shut down legally by the winner on whether the recount even happens, which uh, is a bit of a terrible loophole and uh, also fosters sort of an us versus them mentality. Why are we doing a recount this time or not that time or an audit this time and not that time? So we should just do them all the time is what we're saying. Uh, the third, uh, um, the lesser known problem, perhaps because it's a little bit less sexy, is that uh, public interest is um, stuff like the Senate races, the presidential races, the federal races, that's what gets everyone out to vote. But a lot of the money is actually down in the ballot. So like ballot measures, you know, $30 million bridge is going in. There's a lot of interest for a certain number of people in how that uh, ballot measure goes through. So audits should be across multiple races too because even the lesser, po less popular ones. Um, so as I was trying to say before with the risk limiting audit uh, versus the transitive, I think the risk limiting one's been very nicely explained um, is the statistical analysis. You're checking um, if the results are, um, if the winner won, basically. That's not the same thing as a transitive audit. So what we do with transitive audits is we take a commercial off-the-shelf high-speed scanner, rerun all of the ballots, and it has to be all of the ballots, and we run it through a, a program called Open Count. Um, it's more expensive up front, but it has some benefits over risk-limiting audits. They're not, they're, not, they're not contradicting one another, for example. There's no reason to do one or the other. They're not in competition. But uh, you can basically audit um, all of the races at once, for example. You can compare races. Um, and uh, they basically they, they overcome one problem, which is like if somebody were to you know, change the paper, um, the canceling error thing. So um, this slide I'll skip through quickly. But just basically, um, a lot of times people will uh, point, say we should or shouldn't do things based on in the U.S. based on things that are happening internationally. It's a totally different animal. America has one of the most complex, fragmented voting systems in the world, um, and uh, that creates a false analogy. And for example, one thing that's going to make 
you, uh, auditing more complicated is if we start adding rank choice, for example, because then you got to audit <laughs> those races and then you got to drop those races off and then audit the next thing and that can cause all sorts of craziness and confusion. Transitive audits don't have as much of a problem with that. Um, so what, so we're going to say why you should scan ballots. There's actually a lot of upfront benefits. Um, and um, in general, auditing improves public trust. But you shouldn't take the following, ca these are cautionaries. These are just things to think of. They're not meant to be, um, don't do transitive audits, don't do auditing with a scanner. So here's a example. One is the Xerox bug, uh, dis uh, discovered in July 2013. It is basically an image enhancement thing. Now here's the problem with scanners. They are not dumb devices. Your camera is not a dumb device anymore either. They don't just take what's there. They correct images. And this is a problem because actually one of the hardest things when we started doing transitive audit pilots was to actually get the scanner to not be smart anymore. It wants to be smart. It wants so badly to help you out. And you gotta tell it, beat it over the head and tell it, stop helping me because you don't know what I'm doing. Forensic level auditing, you basically wanna turn off, turn up the quality, turn down all the features. And it, for example, uh, scanners will try to help you out. And one thing they'll do is correct the images. Do you see what changed? We can go back and forth a bit. Hint, it's in the first line and the third line. So uh, those sixes became eights, which we discovered a problem. Uh, the reason this one was discovered, which is fun, is because uh, it was used on architectural things. And uh, that messes with the dimensions of a room if the six and eight get switched. So that was a big problem. That's an example of a bug where a scanner gets too smart for its own good and tries to help you out um, and then gets it wrong. So the other one is, um, so the reason why they kind of do this is because of like legal documents. You're scanning thousands and thousands of work, uh, pages. You basically want to, how do I say this? Uh, it's for the human eye. But when we're doing a transitive audit with forensic level, we're not trying to please the human eye. We're trying to get you know, a computer to read it. And human eye and computer see very different things. So one thing it'll try to do with like a lot of legal documents is clean up the image. One thing it'll do to clean up the image is remove hole punches. What do hole punches look like? They look like little black circles in the left margin. What also looks like a little black circle in the left margin? We lost an entire population of one of our earliest pilots to an error where it was so random when they would take out the vote, we literally could not reconstruct it and had to redo the whole project. And that is a pretty big investment of time and energy. Uh, especially if you're doing a pilot program like a state. So be aware of that. That's one of the features you have to turn off. Other might be things like uh, image correction. So it'll straighten the lines for you and make them kind of non-Euclidean as a result. And uh, that will destroy your timing markers, which tell you what precinct this all is. That's what those timing markers around the edges are doing. They're telling you what precinct, what race this is for the computer, not for the human eyes so much. Um, Another thing that it would sometimes try to do was, oh, what was it? Oh, this is just a third one. It's not in my presentation. But um, when the scanner tells you to clean it every hour, you should do that. Because uh, you'd be amazed how many people just blow that off as like a fuddy-duddy sort of rule. But the black marks begin to streak down from the vote ovals. And they paint the roller. And the roller will roll over the vote to ovals. And we actually lost an entire population once to the scream marks from the ink because the software could no longer determine which bo bu bubbles were filled in comparatively because the, uh, the stains got so dark. Um, OK, I'm getting on 10 minutes, I think. Um, so. Let me see. So basically, I'm not trying to say don't do them. I'm trying to say that there are some things you should be aware of, but they're really, really valuable. I'm a big fan of transitive audits. I'm, I'm only going to talk about them a little bit more because risk limiting has had its cheerleaders today. But uh, you can compare races. You can. We've got. We've had software where you can. Um, uh, where you can, for example, now you'll, if you do the transitive audit, now you'll have the entire population in high forensic digital form. You can actually run risk limiting audits from. Uh, transitive audits from the digital population. What you have to do though, of course, once you have the digital population is check that the paper reflects the digital image. And that's one reason too why you can't just use the digital images from the voting machine if it creates its own. You really do have to do a second one because otherwise you're asking the computer, is this right? And the computer says, yes, I'm right. Uh, so the image that's taken from a voting machine isn't necessarily the same thing as checking it with a transitive audit too, which is fun and exciting and valuable to know because a lot of, I think, vendors are going to start claiming soon that you can do transitive audits just with the image they capture, but that's really just asking the computer itself already the same question. Um, I think that's really it. I think I can give my time to the next guy, and thank you very much.